the purpose of this meeting is to contribute and, and, and provide input to the agenda of gender equality and women's economic empowerment, but also provide concrete inputs and a call to action to uh, those who we, um, are at the moment uh, um, uh, working on designing this recovery. Uh, and, uh, it, and they are, uh, of course, the, the governments uh, uh, of, of the world and uh, the international organizations. We have um, added and included uh, other uh, prominent uh, representatives of the um, private sector, public sector, academia and um, NGOs and institutions that will definitely give a good contribution to our discussion. Um, and uh, I believe that the people around this table are so knowledgeable and passionate that uh, um, the conversation will lead us uh, to very important uh, and, and concrete inputs in that building back better it's absolutely important that the gender economic equity resides at the heart of what's going to be done because as we have seen in different studies as we have also demonstrated some years back in the reports we have uh, produced at the un high level panel having women play an equitable role, economic equity inside IPs is crucial for human development, not only economic development, but human development. And we, we like to use the word build forward better because we really believe we need to start looking ahead. And of course, we need to understand the past to build the, the, the future. But I think saying forward just gives a sense that we're going to get out of this and that we're going to get somewhere. The women essentially were pushed to the front line. Uh, both on in our sort of professional jobs, in our sort of home jobs, in our educational jobs, but at the same time, the the, the response globally, but in particularly on the continent, did not meet the, the 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 sort of new obligations that had come. There is a lot of data on the return on investment when we have gender equity. We know that you need women to be an equal part of the economy for us to realize our economic transformation ambitions. One of the most effective and efficient and cost-effective ways to do a lot of this work is to get as much money into the hands of women as fast as possible. The job creation required to ensure quality livelihoods during and after the pandemic is going to fall on the shoulders of small businesses because they are the engines of job creation. The headlines call the pandemic recession a C-session, and our data support this headline. According to recent research covering 48 countries, not only was the difference in the work of rate stoppage seven percentage points higher for women than for men, but women have been slower to return to work than men. Women-owned small and medium-sized firms have been similarly affected with higher closures, reduced sales, and reduced profits. Women's inequality in the world economy uh, produces poverty. Uh, it is also a major contributor to world hunger and food insecurity, which will be a key element in the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, they already produce more than half the world's food. Uh, violence of all kinds, we can show now, is significantly uh, increased. Uh, and I will uh, point out to you that uh, violence of all kinds is not only a horrible contributor to human suffering, but it is also a major economic drag. One of the reasons we wanted to focus on gender equality when I was at DFID was because it did seem to me that there was always something more important to be done. <laughs> for other people than focusing on gender equality and that there was this sense you had to absolutely never lose sight of it and put the energy behind it in order to really get change. And of course we think about economic empowerment as something which starts once you join the workforce but you know we know in the past year how many children have dropped out of school and we know that it is girls, girls from deprived backgrounds, girls with disabilities who are not going to go back We've estimated to save the children another 500,000 girls have been married in the past year because they've dropped out. 
If you project that forward, that's about two and a half million girls who've been married as a direct result of COVID as teenagers. Fiscal policy must be arranged very carefully to achieve, achieve care economy, to reduce the time women spend in their families so they can enter to the workforce. Care economy must be provided by the government through an efficient budget to create a care system for each member of the family, parents, children, grandchildren. By focusing on care infrastructure, we, we can prioritize investments that can help us turn the direction of the macroeconomic cycle at domestic and at international levels also. And these investments can have high returns on job creation, tax collection, growth estimates. This pandemic has really, really brought a lot of challenge to people. But if we can focus on things around agriculture, leadership, development and placement um, for people, especially in Africa, they will be able to develop sustainable projects. Our evidence show that real change comes from partnering with women for at least three to five years. Moving out of extreme poverty is not something that happens through short term project based activities. To deal with gender inequality, you have to deal with the structural barriers faced by informal workers. 60% of all women workers around the world are informally employed. And if you move to developing countries, it's 90%. And, and so the regions of the world where we have the greatest number of poor people, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, it's more than 90% of women workers are um, informally employed. And all of the injustices and the structural barriers that we've heard Linda and others talk about, the informal worker space. Whether it's Black Lives Matter, um, gender equality, uh, LGBT or other issues, the private sector is in a position to, um, to leverage these messages and is feeling the pressure from shareholders, from employees and others to do it. So what's the final point? I think that this is an excellent moment to link in our work on uh, women's economic empowerment together with the move toward more sustainable capitalism and finally the ESG investing movement because there's huge appetite at the moment um, to, to find ways to, to make these improvements. The other thing that we did that we also recognize as many of you have said that the, the women in our organization um, doesn't matter whether they were working in the manufacturing plant or doing a, a director role, they were the one um, doing more in terms of uh, caregivers at home and in their community. So we also made sure that these people could take unpaid leave and paid leave based on the requirements that came. Uh, we went out and talked to each of them to understand if the workload was bearable or not. For me, the solutions post forward towards recovery and resilience for women and girls is going to be in digital solutions, in digital technology, and in embedding our, our, our fight for gender equality, be it in the private sector, formal or informal, with digital and technology, technology led solutions. And that two thirds of youth who have lost their jobs and not in schools are young women. Technology has become the hidden hero during this period. However, we see that the gender digital divide is only widening as a result of this uh, pandemic. African Women in Media was a journey that started in 2016 with the recognition that not only does representation matter, but that the potential it holds for empowering women and girls of African descent in the world, in a world of increasing inequalities, makes it a fundamental aspect of our vision to change the narrative of Africa. What COVID-19 has done for us is amplified the urgency of addressing issues of health equity. This is the discourse we have in the US. In urban communities, it's even greater. And the link, as I've listened to, to you all this morning, between health and economic viability is essential. Uh, as we look at growing vulnerabilities, uh, particularly in developing nations as the pandemic continues to uh, rage, uh, is going from these conversations and moving those into direct action. At Unseen, we have the incredible honor of seeing uh, what that action looks like every single day. We're accelerating the fight against human trafficking and its root causes. Uh, I take three things with me. First, rebuild forward with a resilience, recovery and reset plan to which gender equality is integral. Second, 
we claim to go all in with equality. In fact, you have equality or you have not. And there's no such thing as a 30-70 kind of equality, right? Third thing, we have collected so many valuable input to formulate a formidable, intersectional, integrated, uh, actionable uh, plan uh, and, and uh, call to action uh, that we will condense, we will capture all the inputs and we will um, uh, circulate among all of you for the sign off and then we will be able to really send um, to our main stakeholders, those who are designing the plans for the recovery, a strong, strong message that we will be following up because measurement will be uh, part of it and so we'll be able to measure that and also hold uh, everybody uh, respectively accountable for what they commit for and what we will do. I leave with, with this meeting with the gratitude and with a renewed sense of hope and um, commitment towards a 50-50 world. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.